kids are being dismissed, let me uh, begin with a word of prayer. Dear God, we are thankful for the opportunity yet once again that we can gather together and sing praises and worship and hear from your wonderful saving word. I ask that you help as I bring this message, these few thoughts that may be empowered by your Holy Spirit, that we might see Christ and be satisfied, be satisfied in our longings with Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. If you would turn with me, please, to the Gospel of Matthew, just three verses, three verses, Gospel of Matthew, continuing in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You'll see those uh, displayed on the screen. Matthew chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now imagine living in darkness for a moment. Imagine you woke up at sunrise tomorrow, 6 a.m. or maybe 5 a.m. these days, and there is no morning. There is only darkness. And you try to turn the light switch on, but the electricity is gone, and there's no light either. And imagine having that kind of darkness for a few days. And I'm sure you will say, where is the light? All right? You need light. We need light, and we all cannot survive without the light. You are meant for light. And the truth of the matter is you and I cannot create light. However, if you look at the sun, we are so dependent on the sun's light to give us light and warmth and everything else that are a result of the sunlight that we enjoy freely. No charge for you freely day in and day out, all the days of your life. It is said that babies start to open their eyes in the womb in the 27th week of pregnancy, and that is when they start to process light. Even before they are born, they start to understand what light and darkness is in the mother's womb. How wonderful is that? They begin to know what is this light. Their brains begin to function and process. And if you look in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verse 2, you see that in the beginning, the Bible tells us there was void, meaning there was nothing and there was darkness. And then you see those wonderful words in verse 2. It says, God said, let there be light. And there was light. But how could that be? All God, God had to do was flip a switch, and there was light. In his own mind, he had a switch, and there was light. And then we're now living in God's world, the sun, the moon, the stars, whatever they are, whatever objects of the sources of light, free of charge, no need for payment in God's world. And so when we understand or when we see the word light, you see that, God is the source of light, but it is not limited to light alone in that word. Not merely physical light. The Bible tells us that God's light is truth. And that is a metaphor used over and over. It's wonderful to see babies in here, so you are free <laughs> to have babies. You want it that way. And so here, if you look at these opening words in verse 14, the Lord Jesus Christ, continuing in his teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, he says, you, meaning plural, he 
teaching his disciples, he says, you are all light of the world. Now let me turn that into a question. You are all light of the world? I mean, how? What does Jesus mean by being light of the world? Well, before I unpack this, this passage, what Jesus specifically means, let me uh, give us a little context. Let me give us an introduction about what we have been seeing so far. We have been looking at the Beatitudes, or the first few verses, meaning verse 3 through 12. We have looked those one at those wonderful verses that Jesus taught. He said, Jesus said, or Jesus described wo- what a disciple is, then what a disciple ought to do. That is what Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount. And so, what describes a disciple? You probably heard that over and over. And what is a, descri- uh, what is a disciple? A disciple is, so kids, you can listen to the message. You do not need to be dis- uh, distracted. So it is fine. Uh, a disciple is characterized by poverty of spirit, first and foremost. And then it described by descri- a disciple is described, characterized by a contriteness, meaning a humility, a meek attitude, a desire for righteousness, uh, a desire for being merciful, uh, a desire for pursuing purity of heart. A disciple is also a peacemaker. We've seen that. A disciple is also someone who rejoices when things are not working out well. When you're accused, when you're slandered, when you're maligned, because you have been a disciple, you have been following Jesus, you may get pushback, you may get some backlash, but you don't crumble under the weight of that backlash. You rejoice in saying that this is a good thing to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all of those things are characteristics, indicative of a disciple of Jesus Christ. So that is what we saw in verses 2, perhaps through verse 12. But what follows after in verses 13 through 16, we have seen last week, Jesus goes from the instruction to the imperative, the implication from the instruction. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Uh, In the beatitude, Jesus is saying, this is what you are as a disciple. And now he is saying what you are to do in light of what you are. Do you hear that? So he's just giving us instructions as to what disciples need to do in light of what they are. And that is what we heard last week. He said, be salt in this world. Be that peculiar preserving ingredient in this world Just as salt prevents rottenness, uh, prevents food from being spoiled, be that positive force, be that agent in this world to curb and contain contain the depravity that we see all around us. And sometimes that could be just as simple as speaking the truth in love to someone. You know, we were in an Indian restaurant, my wife and I, uh, we were at an Indian restaurant a few days ago. And so we were sitting down there, and we ordered our food. And right in front of me was a huge TV. And that huge TV was playing uh, songs. And these songs were dances. To me, I watched it for a little bit, or I couldn't watch it after a little bit. But these songs were quite borderline obscene. And I noticed in the restaurant there were children. There were kids, and nobody seemed to bother to say anything about the content being played on the TV. And so I waited for a bit, and and I made a decision. I said, how about if I talk to the the guy in charge or to the guy who was serving food? And so I respectfully approached him, and I said, could you please change the channel? There are kids. Maybe there is something the kids could hear and see. And what I noticed And this man happily obliged. He said, yes, sir, we will do that. What I noticed was before the channel was changed, the backs of the kids were faced to the TV, 
And after, as soon as the man changed the channel to a kid's program, all of them were glued to the TV. Now, I don't know if anyone became a disciple of Jesus Christ that day, but one thing I know, that the kids had a good time. So, in some small ways, it could be noticing something that is detrimental to other people. It could be as simple as speaking the truth in love. Yes, it does involve taking a little bit of a risk. So that's what we saw as the Jesus said, be salt. Now today we're looking at verses 14 through 16. If that was the metaphor, the figure of speech that Jesus used, be salt, he doesn't talk about the level of sodium, by the way, in your body. He's saying, be that agent, the ingredient, a positive force in the world for good. And today, in these two or three verses, Jesus uses another metaphor. He uses that metaphor, light, light. And what I've done really is to divide this small passage, these three verses, into three sections. The first section is the expectation of Jesus for his disciples. The second section, I've called it Jesus' illustration as to how his disciples are to be light in the world. And the third section is Jesus' intention as to why his disciples, you and I, need to be light in this world world. And each part I hope to expound with a question. And these questions are hopefully thought-provoking for you. The first question for the first part is, is Jesus Christ the source of your light and truth? And that's what Jesus means to ask or say or communicate by the first verse. When Jesus said, you are light of the world, he does not mean that you are the source of light. But before we get to that, what does he mean by the word light? And what he means by the word light, he means that you, that, that he is the light, the word light, the word light corresponds to truth, but not limited to. It means gospel truth, it also extends to your conduct, your behavior, your witness, your generosity, and much more. And we won't be able to com cover all of them. A light simply means, in Jesus' mind, perhaps, is the life of Jesus living through you and in you. It's being manifested publicly visible to the outside world. That is what he means when he taught this to his disciples. So the first thing, the first thing we ought to see when Jesus says, you are light of this world, when he says light, the first thing we ought to know or see is who or what is the source of light. Now listen to the, the Apostle John, a wonderful word in his epistle. In 1 John one chapter 1, verse 5, he says, God is light. I mean, period. That's all it is. God is light, and he then he says, in the next part of that sentence, he says, the negative, he says, in God there is zero darkness. There is no darkness in God at all. And so this is the foundational truth we ought to know about God. I mean, what a wonderful comfort. You know, There's so many gods, so-called gods in this world, other religions propose. And if you read uh, some of the books, about the gods, uh, they've done so many things. And sometimes you feel it seems like a dark thing that this God or so-called deity is doing. But here John tells us God is light. He is 100% pure white light. There is no darkness in God at all. And so you want to know and experience light? You need to know God the God of the Bible, the God who made all that we see and don't see. Remember the words of Jesus Christ himself? What does he say? He claims that he is the God who made everything. He himself says, I am the light of the world. A very, very 
provocative statement in his day. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I mean, this ought to have irritated the people who heard him, the Jewish people. Jesus comes during the festival there, the festival of lights, and he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me, they'll not walk in darkness, but they will have the light of life. And so you see these two statements, God is light, there's no darkness in him. Jesus comes along and says, I am that light. Jesus is that light. And so when Jesus says, you are, meaning plural, you are, you disciples are all the light of the world, he doesn't say that you are the source of light. He says you are merely a reflection of that great light. Let me give an illustration. John the Baptist, you remember, he came before Jesus Christ and he announced that Jesus Christ was coming. And so he spent a few days going around announcing that whoever is coming after me, I'm not worthy to untie his shoes la shoelace. He is the light. I am not the light. So in the words of the Apostle John, this is what he writes in John chapter 1, verse 8. He says, he, meaning John the Baptist, was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. That is very helpful, right? The distinction between when Jesus says, you are the light of the world, he says, we're only witnesses, messengers. We are couriers to work for the light, but we are not the sources of light. And that is what John the Baptist is. And Jesus commends John the Baptist for being a bright light. You want to be like John the Baptist, be inspired by him. And this is what Jesus says in John chapter 5, You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth, not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things that you may be saved. And here it is. He says, He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. You see the contrast, the distinction? He says, John the Baptist came to witness about me, about Christ. He was a shining and burning lamp, but he was only there to witness about the true light of God, which is Christ Jesus alone. And when he says, the testimony I have, Jesus has, is greater than that of John. So John the Baptist came as a witness to testify about Jesus Christ as a forerunner. But Jesus says that he did not need John the Baptist to testify about him. But John the Jesus desired, he wanted John the Baptist as a messenger to witness about Christ himself. And John the Baptist was so privileged to do this testimony, to have this testimony before he came, isn't it? And so in the same way, you and I are witnesses, messengers, are reflections of the light of Christ. And some people think, oh, this is the job of the evangelist. Some, this is the job of the pastor, not just bishops, not just evangelists, not just theologians. Just as Jesus' expectation of all his disciples Jesus expects all his followers to be lights of the world. That is what he means when he said to his all his disciples, he didn't say half of you are lights. He didn't say, he said, you are all lights of the world. And again, to contrast with the source of light and the reflection of the light, some people think that you know they themselves have th themselves have some light or some merit in them, but again, Bible the Bible tells us clearly that this light or truth did not originate with you and I. Matter of fact, the Bible reminds us a few times that you and I were darkness. You and I were in darkness, and you and I did not have the light of Christ at one time. You were doing dark deeds. But when the light of Christ shone on you, what happened? 
you and I were transformed. When you received that wonderful light of Christ, something happened in your soul. You know, some people may ask, well, how, how am I to make sure that I've received light? Here's a, here's a simple test. When there is light, there's warmth. You cannot heat a kettle of water without a light source, can you? Without a heat source. So there's a, a wonderful truth in the simple illustrations of light. When there is heat and light, there's warmth. It seems John Wesley was a, probably know about John Wesley, who had traveled to the Americas from England. And uh, he himself, by his own confession, says, you know, he had struggled with his faith journey. He had come to England, to the state of Georgia back in the day. And he was really not a converted man. He had not received the light of Christ. And you would know, perhaps know the, the famous uh, Aldersgate incident. He said there was one day he was walking in his town when he had returned to England. And he said, my heart became strangely warm. And he said, that was the day I knew Christ. He said, that was the day the light of Christ shone on me. And everything about his life had changed from that point on. He said he had preached so many sermons on horseback, perhaps thousands of sermons, because he was motivated by the light of Christ that had shone in his own life. He was so motivated that he would preach on tombstones, he said. There was no place that he did not, uh, said he would not preach. He went everywhere in the courtyards, in the country, and in the towns. He preached anywhere and everywhere, he said, because the light of Christ was shining on him, it shone on him. What a wonderful testimony from Mr. Wesley. So the contrast here is that we did not originate the source of light. We're mere lift reflections of the light, but we're also used to be in darkness once. The Apostle Paul writes it, thi writes it this way, in Ephesians chapter 5, when he writes to the church, he says, For at one time you were, you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord, walk as children of the light. See that contrast? We were darkness ones. We did not know the truth of Jesus Christ, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as, live as children of the light. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, he again says, because you have received light, he says, take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. You know what happened when light shines on people? When light shines on dark things, they scatter, they go away. I remember when I was a kid, you know, there used to be these little creatures on the, when I turned the light, Light on, all these bugs would disappear out of it because of the light was light, lights came on. And that's what happens when the unfruitful works of darkness. And so Jesus is saying, Paul is saying to the Ephesians church that you and I are to, to be that, the light in this world, the positive force in this world. Another instance in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. He says that our fight is not against flesh and blood. He says that, that there are spiritual forces in heavenly places. There are dark forces in, in the heavens. And many times we don't see them, but they are manifested through other people. So Paul says it this way. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness in spiritual places. There are, there are forces that we cannot comprehend with our human eyes. And so Paul is saying, we fight against them with the light of God's word, with the help of God. And so what a wonderful privilege that you and I have as disciples of Christ. Because there are people who just have no idea about this true light of Christ. So imagine the privilege that you have because people who have no idea about the truth, the light of God's word, it's as if you are the truth. You are that messenger. You are that vehicle of truth. So imagine how 
wonderful at how careful and how careful we must be to present the truth of God's word to other people. They have no idea. And what a wonderful thing it is when they arrive at the truth. They are transformed by the truth. And so you are light of the world is the expectation of Jesus Christ for his disciples. Make a last thought for us before we move to the second section. Now there are people in history who have read just this one sentence. They have read this one sentence, you are the light of the world, that sentence, and they have taken this as just a pure moral inspiration. They have taken this to the extent that they have made this only a moral statement and have rejected Christ altogether. And there are people who say, you know, do the good in the world, be the good in the world. I've seen a uh, in a words written on a picture frame on someone's desk, and I still remember those words. He said, do good whatever you are and whenever you can and all the time. But the question really I have to ask is, well, how do you define good? How do you know what good is? There are people today who say, well, if that is good to you, then that is your own good. Do it because you think it is good for you. I know a man who told me once, I used to give him a ride when we used to go to the office back uh, when we were living in Florida, uh, became a friend of mine. And one day he, he shared with me and said, you know, uh, t for me to get by in life, I lie. And uh, for him, that is his good. So how do you determine good? There was a man who came to Jesus Christ and he wanted to ask our Lord Jesus Christ, he said, Master, what good deed should I do to inherit eternal life? And the Lord Jesus Christ looked at him and loved him and said, dear young man, do you know what good is? Do you know what true good is? Only God is good. There's no good apart from God. And Paul says it over and over, he's saying, I have no good. Apart from God. There is no good in me other than God. There's no one righteous other than God. And so there is that thought we will have to reject as well. That it, this is just a, not a moral good. And sadly we see in our day and age when people twist and turn and redefine the truth. They call evil good and good evil. And Isaiah has a word for those people. You know, the Bible has answers to all kinds of thought processes. And the only thing is we don't read it enough. We don't know how to examine it enough. So Isaiah wrote way thousands of years ago these very words to answer to those who redefine good, evil, and call it good. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20, and I quote, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How apt, how relevant for today, isn't it? Let me read from another translation in the NLT. It sounds better, I think. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil, that dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Well, God is saying through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Jerusalem, to his own people, the people of Israel, that day he says, you've redefined good. You've changed the whole plan of God. You have not heeded to my instruction. You're going after things that are not good. So God is saying through the prophet Isaiah, it is not going to end well if you redefine good if you redefine evil for good. So there's only one foundation of truth, one source of truth. God is light. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And there's no one foundation. That foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And as a disciple of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ must be that foundation. No other foundation except Jesus Christ. Paul wrote to the Corinthian church these words. He says, that church was struggling with all kinds of pseudo 
religiosity and spirituality. He said, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Period. So we looked at the first section, the expectation of Jesus for his disciples. Your expectation is that you ought to be light in this world. But how are you to be light of the world? That leads to our second section, the illustration of Jesus as to how we ought to be light in this world. Isn't it wonderful that Jesus not only instructs, but also illustrates for us? So how does he illustrate for us as to how we ought to do this? Look at the second part of the passage, verses 15 and the first part of verse 16. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. Jesus doesn't give one example, one illustration. He gives two illustrations. I mean, how wonderful is that? I mean, our Lord is a master of illustration. And if you look at the first illustration, uh, if you look at the ancient way or the how ancient towns were built, they were always built on a hill or a slope of a mountain. And it is said that they were built with uh, the material limestone. And so usually when people used to travel, uh, you could not miss the town that was on the hill or on the slope of a mountain. And, and uh, especially if it was bright, it was reflecting the limestone, the, uh, the, the wall of the house, or the houses would be reflective of the sun. And so Jesus says, you, you, if you walk, you just can't miss it. You just can't miss the city that was set on a hill. And so you and I know if you have been ri um, driving on Oregon highways, uh, you very much, it's hard not to miss Mount Hood, right? Whenever there's snow, you always see the shining reflection. It's, it's impossible to say, well, it's hidden from me. So this is the first illustration. The second illustration that the Lord gives is the example of a lamp or a candle. In the ancient uh, days, they did not ha have electri electricity, obviously, like we do. All kinds of devices to light our homes, a light our book, you know, phones, LED lamps, and what have you, floodlights. So the way they used to light their homes back in the day was through a candle, a lamp. And usually there would be a lamp and that would light the whole house because it would be dark by the time it became dusk and there would be one lamp and that lamp would light up the whole household. And Jesus says, you don't take a lamp and put it under a basket. You take a light and put it on a stand and that gives light to the whole household house. Very simple, very understandable illustration. He says, you don't, th this is just obvious. You cannot miss a city on a hill, and you cannot miss the lamp in a house. And so, Jesus uses to these two illustrations to drive his command, his imperative. Because this is the illustration to give us the, the command. What is the command? In verse 16, he uses that connector phrase. He says, in the same way. What's that word? He's saying, in the same manner. Likewise, using those illustrations, saying, let your light shine. He's saying, be that way. If you're a disciple of Christ, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, just as you cannot miss the city on a hill, just as you cannot have a lamp and put it under a basket in the same way. Let your light shine. Let your brightness be visible. Let your life be evident to others. And so this is a wonderful privilege. But this is always also a responsibility. He's saying we, meaning you ought to be doing this. And again, as to understand what does Jesus does not mean 
Jesus does not mean that you ought to be doing self-promotion, self-marketing. There are many people who do that these days, you know. You know, I've got this big thing in my house, or I've got this and that and the other. And so this is how God has blessed us. Come and see, because it's all about me and me and me, how God has done for me, and there's nothing for other people. I mean, that is not discipleship. Jesus does not say, promote yourself at the expense of Christ. He's saying, promote others, serve others. Matter of fact, Jesus warned his disciples. He's saying, beware of practicing your righteousness like the Pharisees, because they do all these things in order to be seen by others. He said, we're not to be that way. We're not to seek self-glory. In the other, in the chapter following, chapter 5, he says, When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues, in the street, that they may be praised by others. You see, Jesus is saying, we are not to be that way. We're not to give as to receive applause from people. He's saying, do it in a way that does not promote self for self-glory. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Jesus simply says, live, let your light shine in such a way that it is plain, evident, and clear to others. You know, I remember during my college days, an illustration perhaps could help, I hope. I remember my college days, I had a senior, uh, one year senior to me, and we used to go to church every Sunday, and we would gather around some friends and say, hey, let's go to church. And so I asked this uh, senior, uh, could you come with us? Uh, could you? Why don't you come with us? And this man said, well, uh, my faith is between me and God, so I just pray in my uh, room, and, uh, pre and that's pretty much it. And I always wondered if I it was embarrassing for him to uh, go to church and be with other people of God, uh, to worship and sing praises to God. I know some people who are just embarrassed to carry a Bible in their hand. Uh, Jesus says this is a good thing. It's a wonderful thing to come together. And so Jesus here the gives the command to his disciples when he says, let your light shine. Uh, this is not an optional thing or a suggestion or a mild provoking. This is an imperative. It's a command for his disciples. He's saying, do this when you live your life before other people. And how are we to do this? I can think of three ways. There may be other ways, but three ways. Three ways, your conduct, your witness, and your service or generosity. First thing is conduct. And again, a question for us, is your conduct backed by conviction? Meaning, is the, is the godly behavior backed by Christ-like conviction? In Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 to 16, Paul tells the Philippian church, Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life. First Peter two chapter chapter two verse twelve he says keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable. Honorable. In Second Corinthians eight twenty one, Paul writes again to another church. He says we aim at what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. You see, Paul's calling, or the Bible tells, that disciples ought to have their conduct honorable, gentle, not to be grumbling, not to be disputing. And he says, because that is how you shine as lights. And again, Paul also gives how we are to do this. We are to hold fast. Hold fast to the word of life. And some people ask this question, well, you know, I'm not able to do this day one because it is so hard. 
It is very hard to live the life of a Christian. Nobody said it is easy. So discipleship is day one. You don't go to 100% on day one. Discipleship is primarily a, a gradual, slow development in godliness and holiness. That is how it always is. There are days of ups, there are days of downs, and there are days of difficulty, there are days of struggle, there are days of pain, there are days of uh, unbelief perhaps, but God is working behind the scenes in the disciples' lives. God is all the time, always there. God promises, I will never leave you, never forsake you. God never leaves you. Even when you think that he is not there, he is right there, staying with you. So the Holy Spirit gives you as you walk with him, as you walk to become, to be lights in this world. And I, I believe that we can be lights to the extent, to the extent we slowly shed off the pockets of dark ungodliness in our lives. No one goes from 1% to 100% day one. It's a slow development. And God knows that, that we are weak and frail. So it's a long time. And so take heart if you think that it's hard. God doesn't think it's hard, but he knows that he is with us. He promises to be with us. Second way we can be lights in this world, he tells his disciples in this world, is through your witness, through your example. Paul writes, in Philemon chapter in six one, or perhaps Philippians, he says, "I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ." You see, you're doing it for the sake of Christ, not for self. He says, "Use every opportunity. Ask the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask God, how may I become a witness for His grace in other people's lives?" That is something we ought to be looking to every single day. And the third part, uh, the third way you can be a light in this world is through your generosity, through your good deeds, through your service to others. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians. He says, they, meaning people, people who are disciples, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others. You see, this is really what others, having a heart for others is the light. That is how you become a light in this world. It is not self-centeredness, not accumulating for self. Yes, God can and will bless you. But then once you have, it is for others. And so there, there are those three reminders for us, three ways you can be light in this world, your conduct, your witness, and your service to others. And there are people who perhaps misunderstand. Uh, people say, I must do a good deed in order to be a light for Christ. Well, Christ says that you must first believe in him in order to do good to others. As I shared in that in that verse, Mark chapter 10, there are so many places in the gospel. A man came. He was sincere. He wanted to have eternal life. And he came to Jesus and said, Sir, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, You must believe in me. Turn away from all the things that you were pursuing. Turn away from those things and come and follow me. That is the first best deed that a man or woman must do to receive Christ. So we looked at Jesus' expectation of his disciples, and we looked at Jesus' illustration as to why or how they should be lights in this world. And finally, the last section is Jesus' intention as to why they should be disciples. They should be lights as disciples. So why should you be lights in this world? What's, what's the motive? What's Jesus' goal 
What's Jesus' intention? And that I want to ask or want to phrase that as a question. Is God's glory your goal? That is the goal. That's the final purpose. That's the intention. Look at the last part of verse 16. In order to complete this whole passage. He's saying, let your light shine so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. You know, there is something very profound here. People can detect whether you're doing, whether others are doing things for themselves or <laughs> they're doing things for other people. I mean, this is not rocket science. If someone is being very narcissistic or ve very self-centered, it doesn't take too long to say, and I think that person is all about themselves. And so Jesus is saying, when you shine your light for others, when you become a light in the world, there come a time there will be an evaluation, especially those people who know the light, who have the light of Christ, who know the truth, and they'll come to a point and say, that person is living for the glory of God. That person is being selfless. That person is denying themselves. That person is serving others. That person is being, being a very generous person. That person is pouring out his life for the sake, for the good of other people. And so Jesus is saying here that they may see. People will see and they will give credit to him. That's the end goal. That is what we ought to pursue as well. The end goal is the beginning. We should start with the glory of God. Our purpose is the pursuit of the glory of God. When that is the purpose, everything falls in place. If that is not the, the intention, then everything does not fall in place. Far too many times, people are seeking their own glory. And that, uh, that doesn't end too well. And sadly here, many people who do that, here's a simple test. You want to know if someone's pursuing self-glory or God's glory, here's a very simple test. Uh, a man can be very, very popular. And that popularity increases because that Acclaim that craving for applause increases when popularity increases. Let me give an illustration. Jesus was very popular, not for himself. Huge crowds followed him because he saw the needs. So many needs were there. There were sick people to be healed, lame people to be healed, dead people to be raised, uh, and thousands to be fed. But you know what Jesus did? Jesus does not continue in his popularity. In the height of his popularity, Jesus said something very shocking in his own day. What did he say? Let me read it for you in Luke chapter 14. Now great crowds accompanied him. You see that? Great crowds, thousands of people accompanied him, and he turned to them and said. This is newsflash, shocking newsflash. Verse 26 in Luke chapter 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciples. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know what would have happened to the crowds? 99% would have been eliminated. When he said those words, in John chapter 6, they said, who can take these words? This is very hard for us to follow this man. He says that he must be first and everything should be secondary. And that is what a disciple. Jesus does not say hate your own people, but he uses hyperbole, exaggeration to make his point. He's saying when it comes to loving God, he must be first and first and first all the time. It is when you put in first, everything falls in place. Everything will be peaceful. Everything will be great. He must come first. Jesus does not say that he will take away things from us. He says, what is the first priority? 
good first things first. So as we see these three sections here, my prayer is that you see Jesus' expectation of you as a disciple. You see his illustration of how to be a disciple. And finally, prayer is that you see his intention for why you should be a light in this world, that you would pursue the glory of God. As I began, discipleship begins with self-denial, meaning the natural desires, the sinful desires. He says that must be denied. And when that is denied, it comes with humility. When that happens, that is when you begin to become light to others. Being light is being brokenhearted for your sin. Being light is being humble. Being light is pursuing and seeking righteousness. Being light is pursuing purity of heart. Being light is being a peacemaker, being merciful, and not minding a little suffering for the sake of Christ. Those who have those qualities, those are the light of the world. I want to close with a, a testimony, a story. And there have been great, exceptional people in this world who have done wonderful things. Many people we can mention, many men and women who have done wonderful things. They have become, they have been salt and light in this world. But this week I was reading about a lady, a wonderful lady, Amy Carmichael. And uh, there's a book if you want to read. Uh, Amy Carmichael left her native Ireland and she went all the way to India as a single lady, beautiful lady saw some pictures from that day, early 1900s, and she gave herself to rescuing children in southern India. And she said she poured out her life, all her life, to establishing an orphanage. And some of the children there in India were sold into the system there to become trapped, being sold into the temple system. They were called Adivasis. And she pour, poured out her life in her, she was there for about 55 years, and she died there. She was buried there. And she uh, wrote, uh, there was these were her own words in the book, and it seems uh, there, was a, there was a procession one day of a Christian wedding. And uh, she was a little irritated when she saw that Christian procession, and she went and asked them, why do you have unchristian things that you're doing in the procession? And it seems... The people said, well, why do you interrupt our wedding procession? And again, I'm, I don't know if I would do that, but she was being salt. She was convicted by her own uh, faith. I and mean, not just that, Amy Carmichael, she said her desire, her conviction were completely in Jesus Christ. She said at a young age, she was transformed by the light of Christ. And that kept her going and going not for one year, two year, three year. And she said that last 20 years of her life she was disabled and she wrote Bible verses on the ceiling and she would lay in her bed and she would be inspired by just reading those Bible verses as she lay on that bed. This lady was salt and light. May the Lord help us to be salt and light in this world. Let us pray. Let us pray in a few moments we will go home. But let us ask God, if you have not received the light of Christ, Christ is willing. He came not to be served, but to serve. The last gospel of Mark tells us, Christ came into this world to give us a, his life as a ransom for many. He poured out his life, not for himself, but for you, that you may have life, and life abundantly. That abundant life is only to be tasted. But without that taste, it's hard to explain it. This is a spiritual truth. Lord Jesus, we ask that your light may again shine on us, the light that shone on us, not because of us, not because of our merit, 
to the truth that is in Jesus Christ, that when he said, I am the light, I am the way, I am the, uh, whoever comes to me, I will no wise cast out. Whoever believes in me will never be ashamed, but will have the light of life. So pray, dear Lord, that your light would shine, that trusting in you is never regretful. And those who repent and say, I'm sorry for my sin, and I trust in you as my only Savior, they would receive the light of life. And may you bless your word.